thanks very much, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Can you hear me okay? Um, I uh, have been sitting here as you have listening to the amazing science, uh, the science that we're going to continue hearing for the rest of the day. So this is a, a kind of interesting break and step back um, to ask, as this amazing science unfolds, what are the social implications of the expanding knowledge? Um, well, I want to start by uh, going back to uh, uh, something that Francis wrote almost a decade ago. Uh, he was talking about what I would say are the two important uh, components of the Human Genome Project and what is following from it. The first is amazing discovery. Uh, the second is the understanding that there is a social uh, obligation uh, that accompanies this amazing scientific discovery. Uh, the notion that not only are we going to learn things, find out things, and they're going to be fascinating, but they will lead us to the common good. And the exciting news, I think, is that we're getting closer all the time. I'm going to talk about a range of social implications uh, that flow and that are particularly relevant right now at this stage in genomic research. Uh, and they come under three general headings. Uh, one is research participation. Uh, that is uh, a, an increasing number of uh, participants in research, human subjects in research, and the ways in which the research that's going forward may raise questions for them. Uh, Non-medical uses of genomics, and I'm going to focus particularly on uh, the implications of genomics in law enforcement. Uh, and then where I think we're all heading the prospects of uh, genomic research leading us to a new era in healthcare. <coughs> so let me ter uh, first talk about uh, human uh, subject participation in genomic research. As you're all well aware, uh, we're now into the era of large data repositories. And that means lots and lots of human subjects. Uh, and that means a number of complexities in terms of how we go about doing research that start with the creation of data repositories in order to have the large enough number of samples to answer some of the questions that we're beginning to be able to answer. Uh, this diagram, this complicated diagram, is taken from an article by Bill Lawrence and Francis Collins. It's actually less complicated than the diagram was in the paper. I just want to focus on a few issues. One is that there are an important set of questions uh, that need to be addressed uh, between uh, some data being collected and then the decision to put that data through a data contribution agreement into a data repository. We all understand the value of these data repositories. They enable us to address questions that we couldn't address without the scope of data that's provided. But there are issues that have to do with uh, identification or anonymization uh, and to, to do with what uh, range of research will be done uh, with the samples. Uh, and then uh, we have issues that have to do with how we're going to structure and store the data uh, and then uh, what uses we will permit. And in each of these areas, questions arise that have social implications. <coughs> in general, um, there are, um, uh, these are the set of reasons or a set of issues that we need to think about in terms of concerns for participants, concerns about participant safety, uh, concerns about the broader implications for participation. Clearly, privacy is one of them. Uh, as we uh, gather and collate large amounts of information on large numbers of people, uh, whatever privacy issues we've encountered before, exponentially increase. Um, we have uh, not only more people involved and therefore more people potentially at risk for loss of confidentiality, but a large amount of data that has to be protected in a meaningful way. Um, we have non-medical uses of information and it's partly because we have increasing non-medical uses of information that we can raise some concerns about this research. And I'm going to focus particularly on law enforcement implications and research on questions that aren't strictly medical. Uh, but I will also say that the whole notion of identity and what it is is likely to be impacted greatly by our increasing genomic knowledge. And then finally, uh, participants uh, who have data put into data repositories where research 
uh, then is done on important health questions may, by virtue of having their data uh, be studied through a repository, lose uh, uh, access to potentially actionable health information, and I think that's a serious uh, issue that we'll have to consider. Um, but let me um, now uh, reflect a bit on uh, the use of DNA in law enforcement. Clearly, there is uneasiness that's been expressed in a number of newspaper articles and statements about uh, the growth of the use of DNA for identification and the growth of DNA banks. Uh, to enable such identification in the process of law, law enforcement. That uneasiness comes because some uses of this information basically raise questions. We've seen uh, uh, DNA identification used in uh, immigration decision making. Uh, we see calls for the routine collection of DNA at arrest, uh, not conviction, but arrest, and that raises questions from a civil liberties perspective. And there is the technical potential to identify a suspect not merely between, via a match between material collected at a crime scene and that individual, but actually between the material and the individual's relative, which raises a lot of social ramifications. These are important issues that we need to track. They have uncertain implications for data repositories because we're not sure at this point how absolute the protection might be that's conferred by a certificate of convention. Uh, confidentiality. In other words, to what extent might human data in data repositories become subject to compelled disclosure uh, for, for law enforcement purposes? Um, so there uh, are a bunch of questions that are quite unresolved in terms of what controls we put on this use. Um, let me uh, quickly say, of course, um, that the use of DNA in law enforcement has very positive implications. Uh, in particular, the Innocence Project, which is now a nationwide project involving units in several law schools around the country, has been responsible for the exoneration of 200 individuals uh, who were wrongly convicted uh, and who didn't have access to de -identification, DNA identification methods and with subsequent access, access have been able to be shown to be innocent. Um, now, uh, this is a very welcome use of DNA uh, technology, and it illustrates uh, potential for profound social good. Uh, it also carries with it its own train of uneasiness. Uh, one, uh, one outcome of the use of DNA identification for exoneration has been to illustrate the fact, to demonstrate very vividly, uh, that our justice system al doesn't always work. In fact, it's been estimated that above and beyond the 200 who've been exonerated to date, there are probably thousands of others falsely convicted uh, and currently inc incarcerated. So DNA exoneration is a really good thing, but it's also uh, a process that has demonstrated flaws in our justice system. Um, and as a result, and this is again another positive effect of this social use of genomic information, um, there are changes that are going forward. Those changes are based on the flaws that have been identified. It's very clear now, as one analyzes the, pro the cases of DNA exoneration, uh, that there have been flaws in criminal procedure around witness identification, uh, around the use of informants uh, to identify suspects, uh, and perhaps most concerning for our purposes around the handling of evidence by law enforcement, including handling of evidence in crime labs. And it is worth know that, noting that the standards for crime labs are generally lower than those for clinical labs. So I think what we can take from this is a lot of uh, issues of policy uh, in terms of appropriate procedure and appropriate interface of the uh, use of DNA information with the criminal justice system, uh, a lot of concern about what's been revealed and basically about the imperfection of social structures so that no matter how good the science is, it lives within an imperfect human world um, that make us, I think, uneasy uh, about the possible use of uh, research databases uh, as part of this uh, system. Uh, clearly, there's another uh, issue in terms of uh, what we might call um, social uses or non-medical uses of DNA information that we've seen uh, a lot of publicity about, and I'm 
uh, showcasing in my slide here two, uh, two particular case examples that have received a lot of media attention, uh, and that is the potential that genomic research will cause offense. Uh, in both of these examples, uh, I think we have situations in which researchers were using genomic data with very good intentions. Uh, they were doing what scientists do. They were trying to answer questions that arguably had scientific interest. Um, in one case, the Havasupai case, uh, there was the claim uh, that blood samples taken for research on diabetes um, were then shared with other researchers and used for all sorts of questions that the Havasupai tribe found offensive and certainly would not have okayed. Um, one of those was uh, migration patterns. Uh, another was patterns of intermarriage within the tribe. Um, and uh, as the article here shows, a huge lawsuit was brought to bear. Um, the first uh, judgment has gone against the tribe. It's now on appeal. Um, it's gone against the tribe for a very understandable reason, which was the individual consent form was pretty vague and would have appeared to allow a lot of different kinds of research. Um, but the tribal procedure that okayed the research was clearly focused on uh, health issues of concern to the tribe. Um, the message here is strict legalities probably don't address all of the ethical concerns. We do have to be concerned about what participants want us to do with their data, what questions they would like their data to be used to answer. This is, we're not in an era, I think, where we can say scientists know best about what questions matter. In fact, we can't do the research without the participants' participation. We need their samples, and we need, as a society of researchers and others, to pay attention um, to what researchers, what research participants want to contribute to in the way of research questions. The other example, uh, the example where studies of uh, selection of a polymorphism uh, led to certain conclusions that probably the science couldn't support um, about uh, potential differences in evolution of brains, um, illustrates uh, also the social context in which genomic research occurs. Uh, genomic researchers really can't just think about the narrow uh, questions defined by genomic research, but the broader social implications of, of their research. Let me now talk uh, about a very specific issue um, that has to do uh, with uh, decisions we make in data repositories uh, because it speaks to another way in which I think there's an interesting uh, sensitivity that, uh, around uh, participants' concerns, and that is between anonymization and de-identification. Anonymization has been used for a long time um, as a way to take a data sample that's identified uh, and, and use it for a purpose, a, a scientifically valid purpose, that wasn't previously anticipated. This is a really crucial issue because now in this genomic era, we can see loads of ways in which data that's been uh, already collected for another purpose could be applied to a new purpose that couldn't have even been anticipated at the time the data was, uh, was collected. <coughs> and the idea is that with anonymization, uh, you can do this ethically. Uh, you, you, you guarantee that there'll be no linking back to the individuals who gave the samples. Um, but there are problems. Uh, as Dr. Gibbs and others have pointed out, um, uh, in fact, um, anonymization is no longer an absolute process. We used to think that we could do it absolutely. We now know that we can't. Uh, and that's true not only because of the amount of genomic data we're collecting, but also as we collect large genotype-phenotype databases, even the complexity of the phenotypic data may allow some degree of identification. Um, also of concern, and I think this is very relevant to the Havasupai case, uh, if you don't remove ethnic identifiers, you have the potential for group harm. Clearly, uh, researchers were interested in using the Havasupai samples to study migration because they were labeled as Havasupai, uh, and that made them interesting. But from the tribe's point of view, it also resulted in data that could be linked directly back to them, which they did not want to have linked directly back to them. Um, 
Anonymization also, uh, and this is the final point, prevents any possibility of return of results to participants. This has received a lot of discussion. Uh, in general, I think there's an understanding that we should be cautious about returning results to participants when we don't know what they mean. And in the early stages of investigation of any health problem, uh, it's likely that we won't know what the results are, are, are going to mean. We're in the stage of gene discovery. Uh, we're beginning to put together associations between gene variants or uh, genomic structure variation and uh, certain health outcomes. But in that stage, we're still understanding and we don't necessarily have information that we feel would be responsible um, to give back to participants. But of course, that will change as we succeed. As we succeed in understanding disease biology increasingly, we will find ourselves in situations where we have information flowing from our research, uh, including our data repository research, that does have clinical meaning. What should we do about that? Well, uh, Hank Greeley has uh, just written a very interesting uh, uh, discussion of these issues, and I think he asks us in a very important way to think very seriously about this issue. In fact, in his words, the choice not to return clinically meaningful results seems at least in the extreme situations immoral, possibly illegal, and certainly unwise. And his example is research that finds a deleterious MSH2 mutation. This is clearly actionable genomic information, no question. Someone who knows he or she has that mutation ought to be having aggressive colon cancer screening starting from the early 20s, something we would not offer to a person who didn't have that uh, genetic risk. Um, the question, of course, is uh, how often are we going to find that kind of information that's so significantly actionable uh, that we create a situation where researchers may have an obligation. But what Hank is also saying is if, you, if that data flows from uh, research that was done out of a data repository, uh, if the researcher has no way to follow a path back, that is to give the information back to the contributing researcher, uh, then uh, a very important um, opportunity will be lost to do good, but also, um, he points out, an opportunity uh, that if the story unfolds could be very damaging. Uh, for research. That is, he's concerned not just with the legalities and the ethical components, but the practical reality that if someone finds out after the fact that the researchers knew something that could have prevented a, a very uh, dramatically bad health outcome, that's not going to be a good thing for science. So we have to uh, think forward. Um, so uh, the example he gave had to do with families like this and the possibility that we will be finding uh, occasionally in our research uh, gene mutations that have this kind of effect and have major implications for healthcare. As we go into uh, the increasingly uh, successful study of contributors to complex diseases, we will undoubtedly find the gene variants that identify the kind of moderate risk family and then perhaps even gene variants that are significant for these individuals. These individuals have a grandfather with colorectal cancer. We don't identify their risk as being on average above that of the general population, but it's certainly possible that there are some polymorphisms in the family that if an individual inherited might uh, have clinical implications, might even lead to some differences in, um, in what we would do. Uh, and when we think about the range of issues that, that arises from this kind of spectrum, um, we realize that we have to think very carefully about how genomic information will or has the potential to improve healthcare. Uh, because it's only as we think prospectively about that, uh, that range of options that may flow from, our, from the research that's going forward that I think we can begin to prepare uh, for the kind of uh, procedures both informing uh, participants of actionable uh, genetic information, but then also preparing uh, for the integration of genetic information into the healthcare system. Um, so I think it's fair to say that we, when we think about genomics moving into the clinical realm, that there are two general pathways that are going to be followed. 
One is the identification of risk to inform preventive care, and the other is the development of innovative therapies. Um, the, the attention has been on the identification of genetic risk to inform preventive care, and I'm going to give you a cautious read on the opportunities uh, for that. There's no question that there are opportunities. The MSH2 mutation story that I just discussed is an example. Uh, I think those opportunities may not be as unlimited as is now being uh, um, uh, projected, and that means we have to think very carefully about that use of genomic information. And then clearly we hope to move on uh, to the stage of innovative therapy. Um, so I'm going to use this uh, particular paper. It was one of a, a spate of papers that have come out recently on uh, gene variants associated with age-related macular degeneration uh, to illustrate a point in the complexity of using genetic information as a risk predictor in clinical settings. Uh, this particular paper uh, looks at uh, genes, three genes, and several variants in these three genes that are related in one way or another, either by increasing or decreasing, uh, to risk of age-related macular degeneration. And these genes encompass the two biological pathways that we now know are involved, uh, uh, angiogenesis and the complement pathway. And what you'll see is that the researchers in this study were able to, um, to do combinations of different gene variants and to uh, estimate odds ratios, and from there to estimate uh, lifetime risk of age-related macular degeneration based on a genotype constructed from variants in these particular three genes. And they are showing that we can do exactly what is hoped, uh, which is that we can identify some individuals who are at very high risk of age-related macular degeneration. Um, so this is a little bit like finding uh, the BRCA1 mutation carrier uh, amongst women at risk for breast cancer. Um, we uh, can intuit that there's a lot of value to that information. We don't have as clear a path to prevention uh, for these individuals as we do for breast cancer, but we're certainly very interested in thinking about how we might bring to bear uh, medical intervention to reduce risk of age-related macular degeneration in these folks. We also find folks that are uh, at significantly reduced risk, and the first point is that both of those categories are very rare. Um, so uh, uh, less than, uh, about 2% of the population have less than 1% lifetime risk of AMD, and about 1% of the population has a greater than 50% risk. There are others that have increased risk, not to that degree, but potentially clinically important. But the other really important message about this particular profile, which is just three genes, um, we know we'll have profiles with many more genes eventually, uh, is that most of the individuals have risks that are just a little above or a little be below the general population. And the point here is that unlike a BRCA testing situation where we're picking out those that have mutations from the general population, if we use genetic profiling, we're always going to be creating a range of risk. And so we're going to have, a, have to d devise thresholds. We're going to have to think very carefully, number one, about what, where we draw the threshold for actionable information, and number two, what we do with all the rest. In particular, what we do with people that have just marginally increased risks that we're not quite sure what to do with, but informing about them about it might well generate worry or concern or interventions of unproven value that might themselves cause more harm uh, than the benefit that flowed. So these are, these are serious issues as we develop this, um, uh, this potential for identifying genetic risk. And just to carry that thought further, as we think about where we draw the threshold, we have to think about what we're going to do with the information. Right now, when we think about prevention of age-related macular de degeneration, uh, really all we can do is look at risk factors that we might address. One of them is family history. That's presumably, or a major component of family history is what we're measuring in this genomic research. Smoking, obesity, exposure to bright light, all of these things are risk factors. Smoking, uh, probably the most profound. Uh, but I think we could say fairly firmly that we don't want to use the kind of genomic profiling that I just showed you um, as a motivator to decrease smoking. Uh, it might decrease smoking, and that would be good, um, but 
what about all the folks at very low risk who now know they don't need to worry? Um, in fact, when you think about the use of risk information in clinical care, it works best if it results in a binary decision. Measurement of hypertension is useful because people who have it need antihypertensives and people who don't, don't. When we have interventions that everyone um, should be using, smoking cessation being one of them, uh, genetic risk is not really a useful way to get at that intervention. Now, I don't mean to be pessimistic here. Uh, in fact, I'm very optimistic that the understanding of disease biology that is flowing from this genomic research on AMD may well lead to new ideas about prevention, at, at which point it's possible that genetic risk profiling will be useful. It's also possible that those new insights about prevention will be broadly available, uh, broadly applicable to the population. Uh, we'll have to see. So, we have to think about thresholds for clinically relevant risk, and they have to be thought about in terms of what we're going to do with that information. And that's going to be different for every individual case. So it's going to be a complex analytic procedure as we go forward, understanding complex diseases better. Now, there is an additional complexity, uh, and that is when we say actionable uh, genetic risk information, what actions do we include? Um, we've known for a long time about the association of APOE4, uh, APOE uh, genotypes and specifically uh, the uh, APOE4 alleles association with Alzheimer's disease. At the present time, we have no treatment available to reduce risk. That may change, and if it does, the clinical implications of that information will change. In the meantime, though, uh, there's been a research study going on, the REVEAL study, that's been looking at whether people who, are, uh, who have a parent with Alzheimer's disease are interested in this information, uh, and it turns out some are. Uh, so they're now reporting on their experience, and they have a group of adult children of parents with Alzheimer's disease who've had APOE4 testing, that is to determine whether they have one or two alleles. Um, and uh, among that group that have undergone testing, some have chosen not to have the results returned to them. That's the no disclosure group. Some have found that they're APOE4 negative, some APOE4 positive. Now, of note, all of them have a family history of Alzheimer's disease. By uh, usual risk calculations, all of them presumably have some degree of risk, uh, but the APOE4, uh, at least in some cases, adds. What's interesting about this data is the significant finding, uh, which is people who find out that they're APOE4 positive, this is on self-report of actual behavior, not just thinking about it, but whether they did something about it. Uh, it looks like the folks that were APOE4 positive got that result and acted on it in terms of purchasing uh, uh, being much more likely to purchase long-term care insurance. Uh, it's possible that there's an effect here, and it's possible that there's an effect here with health and life insurance respectively, uh, but we don't, uh, that didn't reach statistical significance. Um, well, clearly the social implications of this are quite considerable. Uh, one of them is, should we be including risk information that isn't actionable in the usual medical sense that isn't part of healthcare in the usual sense, into healthcare with the costs, the resource uses that come with it. Another question is, is it okay for people to use genetic test results uh, to determine whether or not they buy uh, long-term care insurance? Um, these folks are buying more because they quite legitimately imagine that they're more likely to need that insurance. Um, and that means that they are, in a sense, gaming the, the insurance system. Is this okay from a societal perspective? Is, is this a good thing or a bad thing? In fact, there are complexities to it in terms of how we fund long-term care, uh, in terms of how we use information of this kind in healthcare. Now let me get back to therapy. Um, what I want to argue is that there's a lot of complexity to using genetic risk information in healthcare. Sometimes it's going to provide extraordinary benefit. Uh, other times it's going to be a very questionable use of uh, patient's time and doctor's time and resources and may lead to lots of uncertainties or perhaps uh, untoward social effects. And we're going to need to think about that as a society. But what we hope for is 
where I think the big gains will come, though it's hard to say how soon they will come, uh, is in the production of innovative therapy. Uh, genomic analysis is clearly already leading to uh, an increased understanding of disease biology. Uh, and then we can follow the pathway down, and the question marks are there because for any given set of um, uh, disorders, we don't know how much benefit we're going to derive. Uh, but what we hope is that as we understand, we develop hypotheses for innovative treatment, that then we are able to develop those treatments, that we are able to confirm in clinical trials that the benefit's there, that we hypothesized was there, and we're going to successfully introduce into clinical practice. All of these steps are difficult. Uh, success is not guaranteed. But this, I think, is where the big gains will come. We can't say for any given disease that we're sure we will succeed in following this pathway, but I think we can say with assurance that across uh, important health conditions uh, that the population suffers, we are going to have successes by going down this pathway that genomic research takes us to. Uh, and we really want, therefore, to encourage uh, this pathway to look for the successes and maximize them as they come. As we do so, uh, I've found this reflection by Robert Califf uh, useful. Uh, he has an interesting reflection on the lessons to be learned from cardiovascular clinical trials. Now, cardiovascular medicine has been an area of extraordinary success over the past 30 years. So he is speaking from an area of um, applied research, translational research, and development of innovative therapy where there have been considerable successes. But, he says, even within that context, most effective therapies produce both benefit and harm. We have to be mindful of that. We have to measure it. Uh, treatment effects are often modest. We need to be prepared for that, sometimes unexpected. And here's another really important point. Complex decision-making is prone to error. That's another reason why we have to be careful how much uh, we plan on doing nuanced stratification of genetic risk in the clinical setting, because we may simply be introducing lots of opportunities for error. And then finally, long-term effects are difficult to predict and therefore important to measure. So. Uh, let me uh, reflect a bit on the challenges. Uh, I've said that as we think about this uh, wonderful research enterprise moving uh, from answering interesting scientific questions uh, to developing health benefits, uh, we need to think about two different categories. Under the category of identifying risk to inform preventive care, we have to think very critically about when risk information is clinically useful. How should the thresholds for action be drawn? And who decides? Who's at the table when we decide what benefits matter? When we talk about development of innovative therapies, I think we have a serious work to do in determining what incentives and regulatory systems will both enhance innovation and make sure that the products that come to market are safe uh, and, in fact, validated to do what they uh, claim to do. Uh, we also have an ongoing ethical concern in our society. How do we assure equitable access? I would argue that this concern has particular salience uh, for the world of genomic research because of the extraordinary public support uh, that has gone into the research and the large numbers of research participants now and in the future uh, who, who will help us to get there uh, to the benefits that we want to achieve. Obviously, um, there are challenges because there are opportunities. Uh, this is a, a glorious moment in genomic research, and it's only going to get better. Uh, unprecedented opportunities to understand serious health problems, uh, molecular tools that uh, look like they will be important aids to developing new therapeutics. I want to emphasize the last two bullets, though. Uh, I think this is also a moment where there's extraordinary opportunity for interdisciplinary collaboration. Uh, as the science goes forward, uh, the policymakers, uh, the legal scholars, the ethicists, um, uh, people involved in health service and health resource decision making should also be at the table thinking about this together. Uh, um, all of the, quote, ELSI folks can't do a very good job if they aren't well informed by the science. 
but I think we all do better if we work together. And I will say that's a proud tradition of, uh, of genomics research, um, that we try for that. Um, I think there's opportunities to do more and to do it better. Uh, and I think as we do that, we need to create meaningful opportunities for societal deliberation uh, because some of the opportunities involve serious trade-offs. Uh, how much loss of privacy to get certain gains, uh, how much exposure to genetic risk information or in order to gain certain health outcomes. And these are things that uh, need to be decided together within society, and that's a methodologic problem. How do we do that? Um, I'll just end with acknowledgments of all the wonderful people in my center uh, and our funders, the National Human Genome Research Institute and the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development. Thanks. Any questions from the audience for Wiley? I'll start with one. Can you maybe, or Richard? And I'll get one. Okay. Um, thank you, Wiley. Uh, I have one of those kind of alarmist questions. So if there's a proliferation of very inexpensive genetic tests from third, company, third party sources, so you can send off your DNA and get back these, all this data, um, if the, will the landscape shift because of that? You know, let's say we see in the next year a real proliferation of that beyond our wildest dreams technically and expense-wise. Do you see that as being uh, changing the whole landscape? And, and more specifically, what are the checks and balances in that scenario? So you're talking about proliferation of genetic susceptibility tests that then get uh, marketed direct to consumers? Yes. Um, well, I think this is a great concern, but I, I, I think we should, um, and, and I think there are two concerns. One is that testing will be done that provides no value. Uh, potentially. Um, we certainly see tests on the market that we question the scientific value of. And I think the other is the risk that this will give genetic susceptibility testing a bad name. Um, I, I think this careful, rigorous approach that asks what are we going to do with the information and how are we sure it will help people is really crucial uh, to make sure that we use this technology uh, wisely. But I think it's important to distinguish between what I would call the use of a genetic susceptibility testing medically, in which case we really have to have the outcome uh, data. We need to know that we're using risk information in a meaningful way and have the opportunity to improve, improve health outcome from what I might call genetic, um, genetic testing as a consumer product. Um, so uh, there are tests that are nutrigenomics. There's been an OMB analysis. We know that most of the claims don't make much sense. Um, However, it's not clear that it's really harmful to people to get tested other than uh, they, you know, they paid some money for it. In other words, it might be useful to think about the analogy of an exercise, piece of exercise equipment. People buy it with the notion that it might help them, it might have improved health outcome. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But from a consumer product point of view, what we want to make sure is that they don't have a risk of a serious fall when they got on the machine, that the machine works, that it's not going to fall apart and a piece hit them. Um, so I, I think we have to accept probably in our society that there is going to be consumer uh, directed testing and some of it may be consumer products and that's okay. Nevertheless, I worry that we don't have enough regulatory oversight to ensure the truth in advertising piece um, that ought to be part of a consumer product. One more there. In this era of um, high throughput whole genome association studies, it strikes me that the results are that you get a p-value that's really, really low, which means it's believable, but the relative risk is very low, like 1.4, 1.2, 1.3. And that's not necessarily reflected in the press releases and the newspaper articles. So are we confusing the general public by saying we found the diabetes gene or the obesity gene or things like that? when the relative risk is very, very low. Yes, so the point is that, the rel that we can have I I tiny p-values, p-values that we all love, and the relative risk can actually be low, and the absolute risk is even less impressive. Um, yes, I actually think significant associations with relative risks under two are a priori of very questionable um, uh, clinical significance. I don't think there's any question that there's misleading presentation of it, 
uh, not just by media, but perhaps sometimes by scientists who are trying to frame their research to show what's interesting about it. Uh, and I think we do have to think about, think very carefully about how we frame data, in part because it will gender unrealistic expectations. Uh, genetic risk profiling, as I say, will have clinical value. Um, but will, it will also generate a lot of indeterminate information of unclear clinical significance. And I think when we talk about the gene for Crohn's disease without that complexity, the complexity that you just pointed out about the low relative risks, uh, we're not creating the right environment for conveying that message.